before. Some of you might have met me when I was here before. I think I've recognized some faces out there. I am honored to be here. Andrew and I uh, know each other through my fitness business. And he mentioned earlier that I was a Mr. George at one time. I'm 56 years old, guys. Uh, I spent my entire life in the fitness business. And I was a 1984 Mr. George. I was going to compete Mr. America, Mr. USA. And what it all boiled down to, I never knew what really got me into bodybuilding. And guys, I'm an emotional guy. I'm strong. I'm physically strong. I'm mentally strong. I have this saying, if you see me on the side road fighting with a gorilla, you better stop and help the gorilla. <laughs> but I'm also very emotional. And I've prayed hard and I've fought hard to keep my emotions because to me, emotions are God's gift. I don't care how manly you think you are, don't be afraid to cry. It's an emotion. And ladies, I know you'll cry a little bit quicker than the men. But never let somebody tell you not to cry. Do that. The reason I share that with you, I may shed a few tears tonight. But I talked about my body mode career just briefly. Because less than two years ago, actually it's about 19 months ago, I thought I was invincible. Now guys, I've been through a lot in my life. I've been through a lot of ups and downs. I'm a bouncer of Casey on the weekends. I don't know if you guys know what bouncer is. And it's a yes, I speak in churches and I bounce in nightclubs and bars sometimes. Because uh, I went through a time when I had to feed my family. I had to do that. I don't drink and I've never got caught up in the drugs or any of that stuff. But I work security and the bouncers, you're constantly in there uh, confronting tough issues. And at any given moment, what well, might go from a fun night to everybody, the next minute you're fighting for your life physically. I was working a security job for a special event party back about 20 months ago, I guess it was. Got sick and started throwing up. And I go home and wake my wife up, because I'm not a guy who gets sick a lot, so I go home and wake my wife up. I get home like at, uh, I think I left like at 12, 1 o'clock that night and went home. The next morning or, or a few hours later, we go to the emergency room and they run tests on me. And he's talking to a guy who's never really been sick before. And the guy, the doctor in the emergency room ran the test and he looked at me and he said, Mr. Parks, we're putting you in intensive care. At that point, guys, I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know if I was either up with cancer and but sometimes cancer gets us when we don't know it. I had no idea. I look like I stepped off the cover of a magazine. I'm about 220 right now, but I'm out of shape 220, but I was 240 and very in shape that night. So I literally walked in looking like Hercules. I woke up three weeks later on a ventilator. I was unconscious for three weeks, guys, fighting for my life. I looked like a transformer. I had tubes coming out of my sides. I couldn't eat. I had a tube down my throat. And the machine had kept me alive for about three weeks. I realized that I wasn't invincible. And I had some very dark, deep vision while I was unconscious. And I'll share one with you. I've been walking with Christ most of my life. And I wake, every, wake up every morning as a sinner and I pray that I can fight off some spiritual warfare and take the mask off of trying to be something I'm not and be living for Jesus, living for God, what I just, just talked about a few minutes ago. Because I promise you guys, if you don't think you're supposed to be here tonight, you are. Because I'm not supposed to be here, but I am. The odds of me living with what I had, they said, was very slim. And the doctors in the end told me I lived because I had so much muscle. My body camelized and it ate up all the muscle for protein while I was unconscious. Then I realized why I become a bodybuilder. See, God knows our future. He knows our present. He knows everything about us. Sometimes we forget that. But now when I walk into a gym and I start lifting weights, I realize God knew one day I was going to need all that muscle to keep me alive. And he made me a bodybuilder. And it's very important to me to realize that. And every day when I walk in, I have a personal training fitness center. It's what I do for a living. And inside my gym on the I mentioned it to Andrew when I talked to him a couple of days ago. In my gym, I have a bulletin board. It has my discharge papers. Any guys ever been in a hospital and discharged you? They give you a paper and it says discharge, you know, and it tells what kind of health you have. My discharge paper says discharge 
alive. Alive. That's how close to death I was. And I asked the nurse, I said, y'all normally put that on the paper? I said, if I died off, y'all wouldn't put that on there. She said, no, so I've never seen it before. And I laugh about it. The only thing I can figure out is I was so sick, they was afraid I'd die in the parking lot. They didn't want to think they let me leave dead. So, <laughs> well, guys, I knew if I died that night, and if I died tonight, I know where I'm going. I turned my life over to Jesus a long time ago. Have I been a perfect Christian? Of course not. I've made mistakes, and I've made costly mistakes. Some of you know a little bit about my story from the past. In the mid-80s, the late 80s, I was one of the top bodybuilders in the country. I, I did a favor for a friend. I woke up in federal prison where I spent 10 years of my life for something I wasn't involved in because I made a bad choice. My choice was the wrong peer group. And an ex-girlfriend of mine sent a UPS package to my company federal government alleged it was drugs. I never signed for it, no matter what did. But I owned the company, therefore they made me a co-conspirator. I went into prison to become a lawyer, a jailhouse lawyer, I never went and took the bar. And I won five men's cases and got their freedom that I won mine. And while I was in prison, I had a chance to, stop, to actually go out in schools. The prison took me all over Pensacola, Florida, talking to students like yourself. I talked to probably around 15,000 students in me in prison, trying to make a difference in their lives, to help them make good decisions. And the sad part, when I walked into the schools, I had to sign a paper that I would not mention God. I would not talk about Jesus. And now I go back into prisons and speak. And I minister and, and share my, my faith and my strength and with God and just I pray, I pray all I can in there with everybody I can. I preach and minister everybody I can and try to be a role model for Jesus. And when I walk in schools these days, I still am not allowed to pray and talk to the kids about God. But I know when I walk into schools, they know where I'm coming from. Hopefully I walk the walk and they see it in my eyes. Guys, I know how pain can feel at the highest level. But I know how precious laughter is, a simple joke, and the time with your family. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and talk gloom all day long. I'll share this one last bad part for you. I walked into a funeral home when I was 18 years old, me and my 16-year-old brother. I picked a casket out for my brother, 21 years old. Just got murdered. Fighting. He was all at a party. Drinking. Harmless young men stuff fighting because they were drinking, got out of control, and started fighting. My brother was murdered. Guys, you are role models, and I want you to remember your role models. When you're outside of the church, I hope and my prayer for you is you keep the same face on in school, in the shopping malls, everywhere you go that you do in here. Man, I feel Jesus in here tonight. It is such a presence in here. It's incredible. Guys, take that out of here with you. Just because you're with your friends, you don't have to put that thug mask on. You don't have to put that silly little mask on. Don't be afraid to walk with your Bible in your hand. Don't be afraid to ask your friend, hey, go to church with me Wednesday night. Go to church with me Sunday. Don't be afraid to. Because I promise you, somebody is watching you, somebody is looking up to you that you may never know. You may never know, guys. If you don't, take that opportunity when you get it. It can make a difference in someone's life. You may regret it one day. And when I said, you, if you don't think it's supposed to be here in the yard, I want you to really consider this tonight. If you're not walking with God, please do. Invite Jesus into your heart. So if you die tonight, you know where you're going to go. Talk to your friends. 
Talk to your parents. I'm sure everybody in here don't have all their friends and their parents coming into the church. And I don't either, so please don't think that I'm perfect. You know, I've got friends that I would give anything if I could get their, get them to change their thought. You know, as a matter of fact, I've had a few of tried so hard to quit coming around me anymore. I've learned sometimes my peer group, even at 56 years old, is not always the best peer group that I need. You guys are the same. Your peer group is very important. So be the leader of the peer group. Be the young man and the young woman who's walking for God, not afraid to bow their head and pray in front of anyone. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. In Hall County, you guys are watching the news. You see, Hall County's been on the news a lot. West Hall High School and several others about prayer. I actually went to a seminar where they told and gave out pamphlets everything you're allowed to do in school in Georgia. And I don't know if anybody shared this with you guys or not. But you know, you can pray in school, you can pray out loud, there's nothing they can do to you. Only thing you really, they can't do in school, the only thing that the Constitution does not protect, or the government employees, the government officials cannot pray with you. You guys can walk in the morning and, and talk everybody in the whole school to meet you in the cafeteria or meet you in the gymnasium and say, we're going to have prayer today. And you know what? They may get in trouble for cutting class a little bit, but you're not going to get in trouble for praying. So don't let those people at school and don't let the media out here tell you you got to put a mask on and not be a Christian. Don't let them do that to you. I challenge each and every one of you to focus on your present life. Learn to live in the now. Don't live for tomorrow. Live in the now. It's very hard. If you think about it for a split second, your mind will go, past and future, it's hard to stay in the present unless you just let your guard down. Like a few minutes ago when everyone was praying and beautiful singing going on, we're in the present. And then all of a sudden we go back to the past or we go to the future. We think about what we're going to do tomorrow. Guys, we don't know about tomorrow. We don't know. And as I said earlier when I said I'm not supposed to be here, but I am. I was speaking in a church not long after I came out of the hospital, and I told them this, and I believe this. Jesus is not supposed to be here, but he is. They crucified him. They thought they'd stop him from being here, being in the world. But we know better. Guys, you do, guys do an incredible job of following you through Andrew's Facebook. He's constantly pumping you guys up, and you're on fire for God, and fire for Jesus up here, and it just tickles me to see that you I'm making such a big impact. You know, I don't have any magic words to make your life easier. But I do know what will give you peace and serenity because this is one thing that happened to me when I was in the visions. And the visions were so real to me. When I come out of the vision, one of the visions that happened to me, I asked my doctor about it and he said, that didn't happen. I said, oh, it did. He just don't remember like I do. It was that real to me. But I was hooked up to a machine and I didn't realize, when I went in the hospital, the last thing I remember is, they said, we're putting you in intensive care. Well, I didn't know I was hooked up to kidney dialysis machines, and I was. I was hooked up to heart machines. I had no idea. You know, I had a ventilator on me, breathing for me. I didn't know all that. I was just in another world and my mind was just in a very crazy place. And one of the visions I was having actually, it, I was hooked to this machine and there were a group of people around like you guys and it was a machine and I could deliberately draw you a picture of the machine and it had a little pan on the top of it and it had a clock on it and I was hooked to the machine and the only thing I could figure out when I come out they told me I was on the dialysis machines you're hooked to lines and they're, they're buzzing I guess the hearing I could hear all that because anytime someone's name was mentioned uh, in my hospital room and I had several friends tell me later they'd come by and pray they said Rick you know I'd come by and pray for you no, but you were in one of my visions. So when I'd hear their voice, or I'd hear their name, they would appear in my visions. And it, was, and it was really weird, but this machine was hooked to me, and I was told that I was going to die. So you're going to die if it doesn't start raining. I was in a building, but the ceiling was gone. It was up the sky. And it said, 
They told me I was going to die if it didn't start raining. And I look up and the sky's clear. And I'm watching this clock and they tell me what time I'm going to die. When I say they, I don't remember who was giving me the information. But I know I was in just a kind of caught up in a, in a strange place. And I'm praying. How many believe in prayer? Everybody believe in prayer in here? I promise you, it works. But I'm praying to live. Guys, I'm not afraid to die. I'm just not ready to die. And I'm praying for rain. They're telling me it's got to rain. And water's got to go in this pan, and it's going to somehow save my life. And I'm watching this clock click down to the very end. And I'm praying. And literally, guys, on the clock that I was watching, the second hand was going around for the last time. And everything was real quiet, and I heard drops of rain sprinkling. It started hitting the pan. It started sprinkling. And shortly after that, that's when I actually woke up. When he took me off the machines, I woke up. I had a lot of people praying for me. And I believe the only reason I'm here is because of prayer. My mission's not over. God's got a lot more stuff involved and in line for me to do. And I walked into my gym. I come home, I'll share this, I come home so weak, I couldn't walk. You know, you're talking about a guy who walked into the hospital, literally, if you'd seen me, you thought I could lift this building. I mean, I look like that. My arms right now were probably about 18. My arms then were 20 plus. Okay. I come out of the hospital weighing 146 pounds. I'm, right now I'm about 220, I guess. But I come out of 146 pounds. 34 years of bodybuilding. Strong. I couldn't even stand up. I come home, you know, uh, I had a walker. You guys see people, older people using walkers? I was on a walker. The week I got sick, I was in the gym doing 500 pounds squats. So I was wrong I was on a walker. And I got home, and our bedrooms were upstairs, and I couldn't go upstairs. I tried crawling up our steps. I, just, I was so sick. I've been in the hospital three and a half months. Okay. And I tried crawling up my stairs because I didn't want to sleep on the couch. I wanted to see my bed. I wanted to see my bedroom. And I couldn't walk, so I was trying to crawl, and I couldn't crawl up the steps. And my wife drug one of our beds down, the mattress and box spring that are in our living room for two weeks. I slept in my living room. Then I finally got strong enough when I went back to the doctors and they said, you can start light working out. And I walked into my gym and I had three pound dumbbells. You guys know I have three pounds? It's about uh, two soft drinks. And I had three pound dumbbells. And I was working out and I was repping with Jesus. Every breath. I was praising God. And I praise God every time I wake up and every time I go to bed and all day long I'm praising God. And I've had a lot of challenges and I'll tell you a little more about prayer. Last time I was here, and I think I did share it to Andrew the other day, I was a little bit rattled. I had an entire chain of fitness centers. That's how I knew Andrew. I had an entire chain of fitness centers at one time when the economy crashed and I couldn't keep them together. And I lost everything I had trying to. And I go out and speak because I want to make a difference. I don't go out and speak for money. I speak because I want to make a difference. And I was having such a tough time financially when Andrew called me to speak. I said, I'll be there. The day I came up here, guys, and I'm only sharing this with you to let you know how prayer works. The day I come up here, I went to the pawn shop and sold one of the few things I had left to buy gas. Just buy enough gas to get here and go back. What was that broke? I'm healthy now. I'm not 100%. I'm going to have to have one more surgery. But I, my personal training gym was locked up for eight months, so I had to start over. I had no business when I went back to work. And when I come up here, I think, well, later, I think I just had opened it, maybe. I didn't have any extra income. I think I put everything I had into the gym. But I was living from day to day in pawn shops, sold everything I had. I'm talking about, 
I'm a stuff person. I promise you I love stuff, but I don't worship stuff. But I like stuff. God has blessed me with a lot of stuff throughout my life. You know, and I keep losing it by uh, bad business choices, not because of God. But God just keeps blessing me. So I started praying for favor on my business when I got out of the hospital. All day long praying for favor. I am now probably one of the busiest personal trainers in the country. I'm very well known because of my background, but I am literally probably one of the busiest trainers in the country. I train on an average 15 to 18 people a day. All day long. And I'm far from wealthy. I don't, I, I don't love money. I love what money can buy me, but I don't like money. But I come up here last time, like I said, I couldn't even afford to come. And God has just, he has blessed me over and over and over. I pull up tonight, and I'm not saying this to brag. I'm telling you, God answers prayers. I did not pray for a convertible sports car. I prayed for favor on my business. So I pulled up tonight in a convertible Corvette. Think about that. I came from not having enough gas to get here. What, Andrew? Two and a half years ago? And I've had a lot of stuff, and I've lost a lot of stuff. But I've come full circle. And I'll tell you why I've come full circle. Because God has blessed me for being faithful. You know, when I woke up in prison, I never said, God, why me? I never said, why me? I didn't do anything. Why me? My entire deal I got in trouble with was for owning the business that had nothing to do with drugs on the marketing company. And I woke up in prison with a 16-year prison sentence. This is how I looked at it. So God, why not me? If anybody I know is tough enough to do this journey, I'm the man. I'm the warrior. And I held my head up and I done all I could do to make a difference. Both of those five men I walked out of prison turned their life over to Christ. And they live a good life these days. Because I made a difference in their lives. Me going to prison was the worst thing in the world ever happened. People asked me, did it change me? It changed me. But it changed me in ways that's hard to explain. Because I fought to be the same guy when I come out as I was when I went in. That I can still laugh at a simple story simple joke and I can cry at something tender my wife asks me all the time guys she's watching chick flicks she's laughing I'm crying <laughs> seriously guys if anything I can do for you guys please let me know when my prayers are with you I, even though y'all don't know who I am you don't see me when I see that stuff on Andrew's Facebook, it just makes me smile. Because sometimes when I go into these schools, some of the students will tell me some of the things that's going on, and I'm not naive, I know. I have no kids now. I have a stepdaughter and I have three grandkids. I have no kids. I have three certifications in parenting. Because I want to know what makes you guys think. I want to know what makes you click. I like can only make a difference in your life if I understand why you do what you do. I mean, I've studied human behavior for years. Sometimes I'm not sure why I do what I do. But most of the time we do things from a pattern. But probably the biggest prayer I can do for all of you is to be real, to be genuine. Just because somebody else is doing something stupid, there's no reason for you to do it. Just because someone else wants to bash the other kids in school, there's no reason for you to do it. You never know that one person you walk up to at school, or even here in your church, maybe you're thinking about suicide, maybe you're thinking about running away. You never know. You never know what happens every day. When you see someone that looks like they're having a hard time, God, reach out to them. And if you're having a hard time, turn to someone. And I don't know how many people's in here tonight, 50 people, whatever. There's 50 people in here, I promise you, cares about you. And I'm sure there's a lot more. But 
be afraid to ask for help if you need it. When I come out of the hospital, they were total strangers that made house payments for me. Well, my income stopped. Well, a little income I had stopped. My wife was having to sit in the hospital with me all the time. They were total strangers that I didn't know. There were churches that sent food to my house because they cared. And now every opportunity I get, I try to pay it forward. And I do. I do all I can do to pay it forward. You know, and I pay it forward with a lot of things like going out to the churches. That's the stuff is simple. It's making a little bit of difference. Guys, live up to the role model. Everybody in here agree that you're all role models? We all agree with that? I know it's a big burden to carry. Because it's like, well, I don't want to be a role model. What if I do something wrong? You know what I learned when I made mistakes? People see me make mistakes. And, oh, let me tell you something. When Rick Park does something wrong, the games with Georgia, it's front news. Because <laughs> I'm very well known up there. If I do something wrong, it's all over everything. And usually about half truth. You know, so I always try to carry myself in a way that I want people to respect what I do. I want people to respect that I am trying to just do the right thing and when I make a mistake, I'm human. Because I'm not ashamed to stand up in front of an audience when I do something wrong. I'm not afraid to own it. Jesus forgives us. Whether humans forgive us or not is not really that important. I mean, we can make it important, and I hope anybody you ask for forgiveness, I hope they do forgive you or whatever. But the little video, as it was talking about earlier, about taking off the mask, it was talking about what was really important in living for Christ. It really shouldn't matter that much about what we think about ourselves. It shouldn't matter that much what other people think about us. But as long as we're living for Christ and we're living by the Word of God, it's only their opinion. In your heart, if you're doing the right thing, you're doing the right thing. So guys, y'all keep, keep building this up. I will share this about no hair on the legs. Cutting his hair off. Wax is not fun. I've been there. As a bodybuilder, we're not allowed to have hair on our body. So I've been waxed. And Andrew, you're in trouble. <laughs> Guys, God bless you. I love you. Thank you. Can you give a round of applause one more time? I want you to bow your heads for a moment. I want you to think about what you've heard tonight. I love Rick Parks. I love the word he brings. I love his story. Even though it's constantly changing, it's, it's God takes him through different trials, different seasons. It's amazing to see an example of authentic faith. Maybe you're here tonight and you can say, you know, I, I'm not a believer. I don't really know about this Jesus thing. You need to realize something tonight, that the God we serve is he's real. But it's not just the fact that he's alive that he's real. It's the fact that he's a God that loves us. See, if you look at the story of man, we're all fallen, we're all sin, we've all fallen short. God could have just left Rick in that hospital. <laughs> he could have left him on that ventilator. But he loved him and he had a purpose for his life. He had a, a reason for him to live. And that's what you need to hear tonight, that you're alive because you have a purpose. You're alive because God has a story for you to live out and that you mean something to him. Maybe you're denying you said, I just don't know, you don't know what I've done, and you don't know where I've been recently. The cross covers it all. The cross covers it all. Maybe some of you here tonight, you realize, man, you have not been living up to that role model status. You care too much about what other people think. You care too much about people's approval of you. You care too much about people's favor. 